So what are external concrete form vibrators? Simply, they're a vibratory device that is mounted on the outside or the outer wall of a concrete form. So it vibrates from the outside. And most are going to be commonly powered by either electricity or compressed air, depending on what's available in the area. Some of the characteristics of the um, concrete mix and the frequencies and stuff that we're going to get into a little deeper here uh, very quickly. But again, external form vibrators. That's what we're going to talk about. Why external form vibrators? Kind of the opposite of what we talked about with the internals. They provide consistency, repeatability, reliability. Sometimes, as you can see in the photo on the left, rebar causes space limitations within there to drop, to basically prevent dropping an internal concrete vibrator into the into the form. This um, this last statement basically is the one that comes up at those trade shows. External form vibrators show up every day without a hangover. And that's that's kind of a we laugh about it, but it's a it's a reality. They show up every day. They're not distracted and, and whatnot. Now, there's an illustration here in the upper right that it's actually going to be contradicting to something we talk about later. But it's just simply an illustration that shows the vibratory energy allowing the air bubbles to escape vertically. What we're going to talk about that's wrong in this illustration is two vibrators on either side of the wall directly across from each other. We'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. So it's important, I think, to understand um, the dynamics involved in vibration, vibratory energy, and how it relates to the concrete industry. We're going to get down into the weeds a bit, but I think it's going to be important. So we're going to talk about four main characteristics of, of um, dynamics and vibration. Those are force, acceleration, amplitude, and frequency. They're all interrelated, but they're all important characteristics that we have to consider when we're dealing with consolidation and de of um, in, in precast parts. So let's talk about force. And we're actually going to talk more, uh, exclusively in this discussion about centrifugal force. There's another kind of force in here, linear, that can be used. But because due to their high amplitude, they can cause aggregate segregation. It can drive um, the mix away from the walls. So most commonly, vast majority is going to be some sort of a rotary vibratory device using centrifugal force. Um, I have a comment here that there is a calculation that determines force output. If there's anyone that wants to know those uh, formulas that we're going to talk about in these next few slides, those are going to be shown at the very end of the presentation in terms of um, those calculations. Here in the US, we use, we express uh, force in force pounds. In Europe, it's often Newtons. Another uh, factor is acceleration. That's when a force is applied to a mass, that load is accelerated. It's basically expressed in Gs or multiples of gravity. Higher acceleration levels are usually required for lower slump concrete. And again, there is a formula that we use to derive um, the Gs. Amplitude, that's the physical movement of the load when force is applied. And again, larger amplitudes are required for lower slump concrete or concrete that contains very large aggregates. Frequency. This is going to be um, determined by the speed, um, often expressed in RPMs, often uh, in the vibration world in VPM or vibrations per minute. And higher frequency usually results in faster consolidation and de of concrete. There's a statement about a vibrator rotating at 3,600 RPMs, <clears throat> moves the mass twice as often as a vibrator rotating at 1,800. It's rare you'll see an 1,800 RPM vibrator in this industry. More commonly, 3,600 RPMs for drier cast material and then higher frequencies for um, more concrete applications. 
So this is often, uh, this is where we spend a lot of time with customers talking about, where, okay, so we're going to use external form vibrators. We're going to get rid of the need for an operator to operate an internal, but where do I put these vibrators on that form? We're talking basically forms with vertical walls. Very little uh, of the discussion is flat work or anything, but they should be placed about one third to halfway down from the top. As gravity is working in our favor, it, it helps consolidate the material at the lower levels. There's a rule of thumb that indicates that the vibrator will have about a three foot area of influence in all directions from the vibrator. Therefore, the typical spacing is about six feet apart. So if you think about a form that maybe, let's call it just 10 feet uh, long on one, one wall, one side. The recommendation is to put the first vibrator at three feet from the end and the second vibrator at six feet. That's going to cover that entire wall with, with a slight overlap. And in fact, you'll get some wrap around, over the, around the corners to influence the <coughs> ends of that. So you, you would do that on one side and then you would um, do the opposite on the um, opposite placement on the opposite walls. And then if the wall thickness exceeds six inches, it may be required to use vibrators on each side. And per that illustration that we looked at earlier, those vibrators should not be placed directly across from another. So no two situations are ever the same. We know that there's some experimentation that's required, of course, but how long should a concrete be vibrated using external vibrators. Really, the, it comes down to once the concrete levels off in the form, the particles become embedded, a thin film of mortar will form on the top, you'll see that, and then you'll actually see the air bubbles stop percolating on top of the, the, the uh, form also. Those are indications that it's time to stop vibrating. Um, vibration duration should be approximately, this is, uh, this is a kind of a rule of thumb, um, one to two seconds per one to two inches of form height, 48 inch tall form going to require somewhere between 48 to 96 seconds of vibration, give or take been in plants where they run one side at three minutes and then go to the other side and finish it off at less than a minute. It's, it's hit or miss on how that works. But those are some guidelines. So you have a couple options when it comes to an external form vibrator or a series of vibrators. Portable or permanently mounted. We like the vibrators to be permanently mounted because that is a much more rigid mount for the vibrator. A vibrator that's not rigidly mounted may wallow in whatever is holding it on. And the wallowing of a vibrator increases amp draw to electrics, causes pneumatic vibrators to fight themselves getting up to speed. So a rigidly mounted vibrator is the best mount. <clears throat> but due to cost considerations, many producers use portable external concrete vibrators. There's a variety of op mounting options, including a male wedge and female receiver. So the typical scenario basically is, is on the any given form, you would have a number of female, uh, female receiver brackets welded to the outer walls of the form, sometimes the in inside as well. Um, <clears throat> and then you may, would move one or two vibrators from pocket to pocket, giving it that portability as well as from form to form. I would say that um, um, it's expected that the permanently mounted electric vibrators will last longer just due to the fact that they're not subjected to the issues of carrying around, dropping, the wallowing within the pockets and things like that. So in regard to the external form vibrators, um, we've talked about the, the whys and kind of the hows as to why we recommend the external form vibrators. Another way of mount uh, vibrating material is on vibration tables using, again, externally mounted vibrators. 
There'd be just simply a platform that the material and the molds are placed upon and the vibrations applied to the entire form uniformly, which produces uniform and consistent results. So vibratory tables, you'll see them in a variety of plants and they come in very small um, tables for maybe smaller decorative pieces. Um, I've been to a plant that was doing 12 by 12 uh, stepping stones, exposed to aggregate stones um, on a very small table. And they were just doing one at a time, one at a time. And then there's very, very large wall panels that are that can be poured on vibrating platforms as well. So there's there's multitude of uses for the vibration tables. So a typical setup for a vibration table simply is using rotary vibrators, usually applied in a pair that counter rotate. The counter rotation produces a linear force as illustrated below where you can see the vertical arrows in the middle and the vibrator uh, rotary action is counter rotating. So simply what happens is when the weights turning at 6,000 RPMs, when the weights are all at both at the top, they double the force. And when they're on the horizontal, they, um, there's zero force, zero side force. They cancel each other. And then when they reach the bottom, they double the force. And that gives this vertical stroke on the table. We use this concept to help size vibrators for vibration tables using the uh, acceleration needed, where we take the mass of the tabletop, the mass of the forms in the concrete. Once we understand those weights, we can um, recommend the proper force and frequency to provide the acceleration needed for the uh, consolidation of the concrete within those. <clears throat> some cases you're gonna see some people using a rotary vibrator, a single rotary vibrator on the tabletop. And what can occur there simply is, if you think about, if you put a quarter on the table <clears throat> and run one rotary vibrator, that quarter will move across the table. That's what's going on inside that, that mold as well with the concrete. It's trying to migrate everything in that direction. It's commonly used in very, very small um, um, vibratory uh, precast applications, usually in somebody's shed or their, their backyard as a hobby. The critical components to a vibration table, a base that's suitable to support the weight, isolators, which I'll talk about here in a bit, the vibrators, which can be electric or pneumatic. The tabletop, it's got to be rigid. It could be constructed from wood also, but most commonly steel for uniform transfer of energy. And then a variable frequency drive can be added that allows for the fine tuning of frequency, as well as some input voltage versatility. So just to touch upon... <clears throat> The use of vibration devices in your plants to stimulate the continued flow and consistent flow of material into your processes. We use a process to make sure that, uh, that uh, we make specific recommendations to properly size and apply vibration to improve material flow. Bins, hoppers, and shoots is pretty much what we're focused on here. Cement silos, aggregate bins, whatever it may be. Um, environmental changes, humidity, moisture, things like that affect material flow and the proper use of a vibrator can help accomplish that as well. <clears throat> 